What up, y'all? It's your boy, Mr. Dan Tam Ray Mel. You're listening to the Entertainment Report on iHeartRadio, live from Dubai for Monday, January 14th, 2019, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, facebook.com slash entertainment report with Ray Mel. That's R A Y M E L O. On Twitter at the Enter Report or on Instagram at the Entertainment Report. You can listen to the show anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com or your iHeart phone app, search for the Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. Um, Everyone had a fantastic weekend. Roma was the big film winner at the Critics' Choice Awards Gala in Santa Monica Sunday. Alfonso Cuaron's black and white memoir earned the honors for Best Picture, Best Foreign Language Film, Best Director, and Best Cinematography. Crazy Rich Agents was named Best Comedy, A Quiet Place, Best Sci-Fi or Horror Movie, and Mission Impossible Fallout for Best Action Movie. The favorites scored the trophies for Best Ensemble Acting Ensemble, while its star, Olivia Coleman won for Best Actress in a Comedy. Christian Bale was voted Best Actor and Best Actor in a Comedy for his performance in Vice. Lady Gaga and Glenn Close tied for Best Actress for their roles in A Star is Born and The Wife, respectively. Amy Adams and Patricia Arquette also tied for Best Actress in a Limited Series or TV Movie for Sharp Objects and A Star is Born, respectfully. Lady Gaga also picked up the prize for Best Song for Shallow, her battle with Bradley Cooper in the film. Elsie Fisher won the trophy for Best Young Actor-Actress for her work in 8th grade, while Marshala Ali earned the Best Supporting Actor honor for Green Book, and Regina King scored the award for Best Supporting Actress for If Beale Street Could Talk. The Americans was voted Best TV Drama, and it starred Matthew Ray's Best Actor in a TV Drama. His co-star Nora Emmerich won Best Supporting Actor in a Drama. Kelly Eve star Sandra O oh was voted Best Actress in a TV Drama. And Fanny Newton was won Best Supporting Actress in a TV Drama for Westworld. The Marvelous Mrs. Mizell won Best TV Comedy. And stars Rachel Bershonahan and Alex Bordstein won the trophies for Best Actress and Best Supporting Actress in a TV Comedy. Hosted by Tate Diggs, he opened the show with uh, the star-studded ceremony with a song and dance tribute to the diversity scene on screen last year, celebrating films such as Roma, Crazy Rich Asians, Black Panther, Green Book, Black Klansman, and If Beale Street Could Talk. Eddie Murphy has confirmed he will reprise his role of fictional African Prince Akeem in a sequel to his 1988 comedy, Coming to America. Murphy said in a statement Friday, After many years of anticipation, I'm thrilled that Coming to America 2 is officially moving forward. We assembled a great team that will be led by director Craig Ruhr, who just did an amazing job on Dolmite is my name, and I'm looking forward to bringing all these classic and beloved characters back to the big screen. The movie is being penned by blackish creator Kenya Barris. It will follow Akeem as he returns from Zamunda to the United States to reconnect with his estranged son, the heir to the throne. The original film co-starred Arsenio Hall, James Earl Jones, Sherry Headley, and John Amos. Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan, the scribes who penned four of the seven Saw horror movies, have signed on to write the next chapter in the Final Destination film franchise. Melton tweeted Friday along with the link to the Hollywood Reporter's story about their involvement in the project, Final Destination reboot in the works with Saw writers exclusive Hey That's Us at Marcus Dunstan. The rap also confirmed the news. The first supernatural thriller in New Line Final Destination series was released in 2000. Sorry, Devin Sawa, Ali Larder, and Sean William Scott. It uh, it was about people killed after escaping a plane explosion that one member of the group had a premonition about. The most recent installment, Final Destination 5, was in theaters in 2011. The cast includes Nicholas D'Agosto, Emma Bell, Miles Fisher, Arlene Escapeta, Dave Kochner, and Tony Todd. No plot details or casting for the new movie have been announced yet. Game of Thrones will kick off its eighth and final season on April 14th. HBO announced a date Sunday night. The network also released a 90-second trailer showing sisters Sansa and Iris Stark, played by Sophie Turner and Maisie Williams, and their foster brother Jon Snow, played by Kit Harington, visiting the Torchlight, their family's underground crypt, where they are faced with statues that look like themselves. The film, the clip ends with the flame blown out, a mist filling the cavern, John drawing his sword, and the premiere date being revealed. The show co-stars Peter Dinklage, Amelia Clark, Lena Headley, Niccolo Costa-Wadu, Jeremy Flynn, and Ian Glenn. 
Singer Tamar Braxton, Olympic swimmer Ryan Lockie, and former White House Communications Director Anthony Scaramucci will compete on Season 2 of CBS's Big Celebrity Big Brother. Other housemates confirmed for the reality competition series includes actors Joy Lawrence and Jonathan Bennett, comedian Tom Green, Olympic track star and bobsledder Lolo Jones, actress Lindsay Lohan's mother Dina, former pro, uh, football player Ricky Williams, former pro wrestler Nat, uh, Natalie of, of Eva Marie, singer and television personality Candy Burris, and Kato Caitlin, a talk show host who first gained fame as one of the headline-grabbing witnesses in O.J. Simpson's double murder trial. The two-night season premieres to air January 21st to the 22nd, with Julie Chen returning as host. Over three weeks, it will air 13 times with two-hour finales on February 13th. The message on the show's website says, These 12 celebrity house guests will live together in the iconic Big Brother house, which is outfitted with 80 HD cameras and over 100 microphones capturing their every move 24 hours a day with zero contact to the world beyond its walls. Uh, and each week, one or more celebrity house guests will be evicted from the house, and the last one remaining will take home the grand prize of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Pulitzer Prize-winning Hamilton creator Lin Manuel Miranda brought his hip hop musical to Puerto Rico this weekend. With Miranda once again playing the lead role of historical figure Alexander Hamilton, the show's 17-day, 23-performance run at the Centro de Bellas Artes Luis A. Ferre in San Juan began with a sellout crowd of 1,800 people on Friday. The production is intended to raise about $15 million to support Puerto Rico artists and art institutions. Miranda has also said he hopes the show will bring money and attention to an area still struggling to recover after Hurricane Maria. Miranda was born and raised in New York City to Puerto Rican parents. The Washington Post said that the cast received a wildly enthusiastic ovation on opening night and Miranda appeared on the stage at the end of it waving a Puerto Rican flag. Miranda told reporters in Spanish after the show, according to the New York Times, today Puerto Rico gave me more energy than ever in my life in that moment. I never felt anything like that. Screenwriter producer Shonda Rhimes was in the audience Friday. Rhimes posted a photo of the cast on stage tweeting, I have Puerto Rico in my heart. Hashtag uh, Papi Te Sepas. Hashtag Hamilton. Saving Private Ryan, true romance actor Tom Sizemore has been released on a $1,000 bail after he was arrested on misdemeanor drug possession charges, California's Burbank Police Department said. Media reports said Friday officers pulled over Sizemore on January 5th for failure to display current registration. They allege, found, uh, they allege that they found substances they believe to be meth and heroin in the car after the 57-year-old actor consented to a vehicle search. Sizemore's other credits include Born on the 4th of July, Point Break, Heart and Souls, Wyatt Earp, Natural Born Killers, Heat, Pearl Harbor, Black Hawk Down, and Twin Peaks. He posted a Facebook message on Friday asking, Who's interested in signing up for my acting class coming soon in Los Angeles and surrounding cities? Sizemore, who has had a history of substance abuse and brushes with the law, did not mention his most recent arrest in the post. Megyn Kelly has officially parted ways with NBC, agreeing to be to pay the rest of her $69 million three-year contract signed two years ago. In October, her morning news show, Megyn Kelly Today, was canceled after the 47-year-old anchor expressed sympathy for white people wearing blackface as part of a Halloween costume. Since then, both sides have negotiated over parts of her long-term contract. Kelly reportedly will be paid around $30 million, according to sources with NBC and CNN. The network said Friday night, the parties have resolved their differences, and Megyn Kelly is no longer an employee of NBC. She'll be subjected to an industry-standard non-disparagement clause, which prevents what she can say about working at NBC. But she reportedly is not subjected to a non-competent clause in her contract. On Thursday, she says, you will definitely see me back on when approached by celebrity photographers in New York City. In January 2017, she left Fox News after 12 years, including serving as a primetime host and co-anchor of, a politi of political coverage. Kelly joined the cable network after serving as a corporate attorney. At NBC, several months later, she hosted a Sunday evening news magazine and later added the 9 a.m. hour of the Today Show in September 2017. Sunday Night with Megyn Kelly drew poor ratings and ended a short run in the summer of 2017. 
says her departure from the third hour of today. Her show has been replaced by rotating anchors Dylan Dreyer, Shanae Jones, Craig Melvin, Al Roker, and others. Their ratings were an 80% increase from her average audience of 29 million. Roker and Melvin, who are both African-American, criticized her blackface comments, and NBC News chairman Andy Lack condemned Kelly's comments at a town hall. She apologized on her show the following day, saying, The country feels so divided, and I have no wish to add to that pain and offense. But she didn't appear on the network again, and three days after her blackface remarks first aired, NBC announced that it had canceled the show. Artist Joe Andres, uh, Steve Buscemi's wife of more than 30 years, has died at the age of 65. E! News said it confirmed Andres' death, but did not know the cause of it. TMZ reported a burial was held earlier this week. The couple married in 1987. They have a 29-year-old son named Lucian. Andres was a choreographer who also directed the 1996 independent film Black Kites. Buscemi is best known for his work on Boardwalk Empire, The Sopranos, and numerous collaborations with the Coen brothers and Adam Sandler. Sandler. Maroon 5 will headline next month's Pepsi Super Bowl 53 halftime show on CBS, the NFL confirmed Sunday. The Grammy-winning rock band has been rumored for months to be the musical act for the year's biggest professional football game, but it was not officially announced by the NFL until now. A brief video of the band was also posted to the Maroon 5 Twitter account with the caption, hashtag uh, Super Bowl 53. The game is scheduled to be played at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta on February 3rd. Guest artists expected to appear alongside Maroon 5 include Travis Scott and Big Boy. Among the previous music icons who have performed that past Super Bowls are Justin Timberlake, Lady Gaga, Coldplay, Kelly Perry, uh, Katy Perry, Missy Elliott, Lenny Kravitz, Bruno Mars, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Madonna, Nicki Minaj, The Who, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Prince, The Rolling Stones, Paul McCartney, and U2. Room 5 is best known for hits such as She Will Be Love, Payphone, Animals, One More Night, Moves Like Jagger, and Girls Like You. 21 Savage, I Am, I Was is the number one album in the United States for a second week. Coming in at number two on the Billboard 200 roster, day and Saturday is Hoodie SN, uh, a boogie with the hoodie, followed by Meek Mill's Championship at number three, Post Malone's Beer Bong and Bentley's at number four, and the Spider Man into the Spider Verse soundtrack at number five. Right out of the top tier are Drake's Scorpion at number six, Travis Scott's Astro World at number seven, The Greatest Soundtrack, uh, The Greatest Showman soundtrack at number eight, Kodak Black's Dying to Live at number nine, and A Star is Born soundtrack at number ten. The Kevin Hart, Brian Cranston dramedy The Upside is the number one movie in North America this weekend, earning $19.6 million in receipts. Box Office Mojo.com announced Sunday. Coming in number two is Aquaman with $17.3 million, which was number one for three weeks, followed by A Dog's Way Home at number three with $11.3 million, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse at number four with $9 million, and Escape Room at number five with $8.9 million. Right up the top tier are Mary Poppins Returns at number six with $7.2 million dollars bumblebee at number seven with 6.8 million dollars on the basis of sex at number eight with 6.2 million dollars the mule number nine with 5.5 million dollars and vice at number 10 with 3.3 million dollars and now let's take a look at what happened on this date in entertainment history. On this date in 1954, Marilyn Monroe marries Joe DiMaggio. It was the ultimate all-American romance. The tall, handsome hero of the country's national pastime captures the heart of the beautiful, glamorous Hollywood star. But the brief, volatile marriage of Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio, the couple wed on this date in 1954, barely got past the honeymoon before cracks began to show in its brilliant veneer. In 1952, the New York Yankee slugger DiMaggio asked an acquaintance to arrange a dinner date with Monroe, a buxom blonde model-turned-actress whose star uh, was on the rise after supporting roles in films such as Monkey Business in 1952 and a lead role in the B-movie thriller Don't Bother to Knock in 1952. The press immediately picked up on the relationship and began to cover ex exhaustively, though Monroe and DiMaggio preferred to keep a low profile, spending evenings at home or in the back corner of DiMaggio's restaurant. On January 14, 1954, they were married at San Francisco City Hall, where they were mobbed by reporters and fans. 
Monroe had apparently mentioned the wedding plans to someone at her film studio who leaked it to the press. While Monroe and DiBaggio were on their honeymoon in Japan, Monroe was asked to perform, uh, to travel to Korea and perform for the American soldiers stationed there. She complied, leaving her unhappy new husband in Japan. After they returned to the United States, tension continued to build, particularly around DiMaggio's discomfort with his wife's sexy image. One memorable blow-up occurred in September 1954 on the New York City set of the director Billy Wilder's The Seven Year Itch. As Monroe filmed the now-famous scene in which she stands over a subway grate with the air blowing up her skirt, a crowd of onlookers pressed gathered. Wilder himself had reportedly arranged the media attention. As her skirt blew up again and again, the crowd cheered uproariously, and DiMaggio, who was on set, became irate. DiMaggio and Monroe were divorced in October 1954, just 274 days after they were married. In her filing, Monroe accused her husband of mental cruelty. She married the playwright Arthur Miller in 1956, but their marriage also ended in divorce in January 1961, leaving Monroe in a state of emotional fragility. In February 1961, she was admitted to a psychiatric clinic. It was DiMaggio who secured her release and took her to the Yankees' Florida spring training camp for rest and relaxation. Though rumors swirled about their remarriage, they maintained their good friend's status. When the 36-year-old Monroe died of a drug overdose on August 5, 1962, DiMaggio arranged the funeral. For the next two decades until his own death in 1999, he sent roses several times a week to her grave in Los Angeles. On Sunday, in 1970, Diana Ross and the Supremes performed their final concert. They were the most successful American pop group of the 1960s, a group whose 12th number one hits is in the first full decade of the rock and roll era placed them behind only Elvis and the Beatles in terms of chart dominance. They helped define the very sound of the 60s, but like fellow icons, the Beatles and Simon and Garfunkel, they came apart in the first year of the 70s. The curtain closed for good on Diana Ross and Supremes on January 14, 1970 at the Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. The farewell concert in Vegas was a final act in a drawn-out breakup that didn't become official until November 1969, but probably became inevitable in July 1967 when Motown Records chief Barry Gordy gave Diana Ross top billing over the Supremes. That move clearly signaled Gordy's intention to launch Diana on a solo career, something he may have had in mind from the moment he upgraded her first name from Diane and upstaged her fellow Supremes by making Diana the group's official lead singer. Mary Wilson Forrest Brallard and Diana Ross grew up together in Detroit's Brewster Housing Project and started out as co-equals in singing groups they called the Primettes. It took them several years of toying within the hip factory Barry Gordy was assembly before the girls made their breakthrough in 1964. Those years included a Gordy-inspired name change for the group, a Gordy mandate buffing and polishing in Motown's in-house finishing school, and eventually a Gordy-dictated elevation of Diana over her childhood friends Flo and Mary. Yet even into 1964, the group that became Motown's greatest commercial success was known as the No Hit Supremes around Hintsville, USA, the company's Detroit headquarters. It was Where Did I Love Go, a song written by the soon-to-be legendary team of Holland Dozier Holland and rejected by the soon-to-be Eclipse Marvelettes that kicked off a run of success that saw the Supreme score an incredible five straight number one singles in a 10-month span from July 1964 to May 1965. Five more number ones would come out before Motown Force Force Florence Ballard out of the group she created, and two more would come with Cindy Bird's song as Ballard's replacement before Diana, R- Diana Ross left the Supremes behind. And that is your entertainment report for Monday, January 14th, 2019. I'm your host, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello. I'll be back tomorrow to deliver some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Facebook.com slash The Entertainment Report with Ray Mello. That's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O. On Twitter at The Answer Report or on Instagram at The Entertainment Report. You can listen to this episode or any previous episodes of The Entertainment Report anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com or your iHeart phone app, search for the Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. Good night, and God bless you all.